Good evening. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, this is a great turnout. My name is Shannon Holliday, and I coordinate the Common Reading Program at Shepherd. And so since 2007, each year we've chosen a different book, and we've read it together, and it's allowed us to explore a range of topics across genres and encourage reading and foster dialogue and have sometimes difficult conversations. We've welcomed best-selling authors to Shepherdstown, including Henry Louis Gates Jr., Hyun So Lee, Anne Pancake, Catherine Clinton, Jean Marie Laskus, Jay Allison, and tonight's speaker, Rachel Louise Snyder. Each year we've collectively picked up a book, turned the pages, and come together to talk about what we've read. It's been enlightening and engaging, and it's been possible because people like you show up for events like this. So thank you. The Common Reading is made possible through our sponsor, the Shepherd University Foundation, and some individual program donors. A selection committee and a planning committee made up of students, faculty, staff, and community members all help choose the books and shape the programs that we have. And tonight's event would not be possible without the help of the Eastern Panhandle Empowerment Center, or EPIC, who has a table out front, Shepherd's Counseling Services and Multicultural Student Affairs, all of our volunteers who helped with check-in, Chase, Sean, and Andrew, our technical staff, and the Shepherd University Bookstore, who's selling books outside for the signing tonight. So thank you to all those key partners. Tonight's event addresses sensitive topics of intimate partner violence that may be triggering for some. If you would like support or want to talk to someone, an advocate, people from the Empowerment Center and Shepherd's Counseling Services are here tonight in the theater as well as in the lobby. Feel free to slip out and seek an advocate if you wish. Thanks to these amazing professionals for being with us tonight. The banners behind me hanging on stage are part of an art project envisioned and coordinated by graduate student Emma Williams. You can read more about the project on the back of your program, and I'd like to recognize her for her vision and dedication, along with all of the students who also contributed. Over 1,500 students wrote their own definitions of what love is and what love is not on these banners. So um, thanks for making this powerful artistic statement a reality. After the um, talk, you can come up on stage and look closer if you'd like to read carefully what each of them says. After the talk, we'll also have um, time for questions from the audience, and there are microphones on either end, or we can pass one to you, or you can just ask your question out loud. We'll raise the lights for that a little bit. Um, and we'll have a book signing and some refreshments, so I hope you'll join us for that as well. Now I'm honored to tell you about tonight's guest, Rachel Louise Snyder. Snyder is the author of this year's Common Reading, No Visible Bruises, What We Don't Know About Domestic Violence Can Kill Us. The book examines the true scope of domestic violence and illuminates the intersections between violence, poverty, homelessness, and addiction, underscoring the fact that none of these patterns emerges in a vacuum. No Visible Bruises won the Hillman Prize and the New York Public Library Helen Bernstein Book Award and was named one of the top 10 books of 2019 by the New York Times. Earlier this year, Snyder also released a new memoir titled Women We Buried, Women We Burned, which chronicles her tumultuous journey from teenage runway, runaway to global reporter. As a journalist, Snyder has traveled to more than 50 countries covering stories of human rights, natural disaster, and war. She is also the author of Fugitive Denim, a moving story of people and pants in the borderless world of global trade, and the novel What We've Lost is Nothing. Her print work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, Slate, and The Washington Post, among others. She has reported for public radio programs, including This American Life, Marketplace, and All Things Considered, and teaches creative writing and journalism at American University in Washington, DC. 
Please join me in welcoming Rachel Louise Snyder. Thank you, thank you. Can I take this out? Okay. Hi. This is incredible, by the way. Who is the woman who made this here tonight? No, you? Oh my God. This, this is like. I gotta take a little video of this later. I mean, this is just a beautiful artwork um, and just so affecting. You know, art is really the language of emotion, as I say over and over again. So thank you so much for having me. I can't believe this gorgeous little town is only an hour and a half from my house. I just discovered it today. It's amazing. Um, you can expect to see me on weekends now and again, I think. Um, so I came to domestic violence really uh, through a side door. I, I studied fiction in graduate school. I have an MFA in fiction. Um, I've never in my life taken a journalism class, yet I'm known as a, as a journalist. Uh, it's not the most auspicious start one would have for writing a book about domestic violence that is, in fact, a literary journalist book. But the thing that really got me to understand domestic violence, ironically, was fiction. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. So I'm going to do this in sort of two parts. Um, you'll accidentally get a little um, lesson in creative writing fiction. Um, and you don't have to pay extra for that. That just comes with the talk. So um, after grad school <clears throat> a million years ago, I, um, I really wanted to travel. And I really wanted to write. But I couldn't figure out how to put those two things together in a way that was economically sound. Um, and I remember going, a friend of mine, my best friend and I went to um, Guatemala. I think it was Guatemala and Honduras. This is like, I don't know, the mid-90s or somewhere around there. And we met this British couple. And my best friend at the time, um, she works for Health and Human Resources now, the uh, federal government. Um, but at the time, she was an amateur photographer. So she's taking these incredible photos of Tikal and you know various places in Guatemala. And I'm writing in my journal and making up fiction. And this, this British friend of mine says to, to the two of us, God, if I had a photographer who was right there and a writer who was right there, I'd be doing all these stories about my travels. Now, you would think that I would have come up with that idea on my own. But no, it took this British man pointing out the fact that I'm sitting there as a writer and she's sitting there as a photographer and that we could actually do this for a living. Not a good living, mind you, but you know enough to get our, our travels covered. And so that's what we began to do once that light bulb went off. We went to Tibet and we covered stories of women forcibly sterilized by the Chinese government. We went to uh, India and did stories of child marriage. We went to Nepal and did stories of Tibetan refugees. We went to, um, where else did we go? We went to Cambodia and did stories of um, uh, gang rape for weekend sport for wealthy young Khmer uh, men. We did story after story of what in the 90s we called women's issues and what the rest of us now know today as human rights issues. You can thank Hillary Clinton for pointing that out back in 1990, whatever it was. Women's issues are human rights issues. And in all of those stories, domestic violence really sat as the origin of so many of the other forms of violence that I was writing about or the, or the other human rights issues that I was writing about. So much so that I knew it, but never asked about it. You know, it was like, oh yes, of course this 13 year old Romanian girl, you know, who's a child bride has domestic violence in her background, but that's not my story, right? I really had a very, um, a s almost tunnel vision around the issue. I, I thought, you know, well, if someone's involved in a domestic violence situation, that's because they've made bad choices in life. I mean, I knew nothing. I didn't know even 
that that was a myth, right? That if, if things were bad enough, a victim would just leave. Like, I bought into that as a myth. I never even realized it was a myth. Um, you know, I thought restraining orders and shelters were adequate responses. Like, I'd heard the word shelter and thought, oh, well, problem solved, right? It's amazing when I think back about, about what I thought at that time. So, I'm sorry, this is, like, this is like a table at a restaurant where you're like, wait, I just need a matchbox. Um, we don't, they don't have those anymore, right? Like, anyway. Um, so let me back up for a second and talk about fiction. So as, as um, in the introduction, I think you, the, you, the, uh, you know that I teach at American University, and um, I teach fiction and nonfiction and, and literary journalism. And one of the things I, I talk about with my students, especially my, young, my younger students, my undergraduates, is plot. Like, what does plot mean? I get a lot of stories that are things like, there's like a car wreck, and then following a car wreck might be an explosion, and then following an explosion, there might be like a kidnapping or some sort of bombing. There's almost always a murder sort of tucked in there somewhere. And what I tell my students is that plot is not just a series of unrelated events, right? Someone is killed and then someone else goes and, you know, blows up a building and then someone else goes and, you know, they have to fight off an army of extraterrestrials. I'm getting a lot of science fiction these days. Interesting. Um, but what they don't what they don't always understand is that plot isn't just a series of events. It's a series of choices that a character is forced to make, right? And they're not unrelated choices. Because a character chooses A, they now have to make another choice, and they have to choose between C and D. And because they choose D, they now have another choice to make, and that's between E and F, and they choose F. So plot is a series of very carefully constructed, related events. Right? And then there's usually an escalation in there. So I want you to think about that as a definition, cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. And I'll come, I'll come back to that in a moment. So, um, so I, I was doing all this traveling, and I was writing stories about, uh, primarily with women at the center, but not always uh, women at the center. And um, I was I, I moved uh, to London for a couple of years, and then I moved to Phnom Penh, Cambodia, for six years, and worked for Marketplace Radio. Published my first book, which we won't talk about because it's really crappy, and I will body block block you if you try and buy it. But um, but I moved back to America in 2009, and I thought, oh, what am I going to write about now? I've spent the last you know two decades or whatever writing about you know, women in, in all these foreign countries, but we don't really have those kinds of problems in America. I didn't really think we didn't have problems, but I wasn't like, oh, well, we don't, you know, gang rape for weekend sport. We don't forcibly sterilize people. We don't, you know, I just, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to write about. And so I was standing on the driveway of a friend of mine. You may know the writer Andre Debus III. He wrote House of Sand and Fog, wonderful movie if you haven't seen it. Um, he wrote Townie. Actually, you should have him. Come. He's a lot of fun. You should have him as one of your, one of your readers. Anyway, um, so I was standing on his driveway. He and his wife are my daughter's godparents, and his sister drove up. I recount this in the preface of No Visible Bruises. I'd never met his sister before. He had talked about her for years. He introduces us. It's a Saturday morning. The whole family's getting ready to go on this camping trip, and he's got this big long list of stuff he has wants his sister to do. Buy, you know, go to the farmer's market and the beer store and whatnot. And so he introduces us, and I say, oh, what do you do? And she says, oh, I work at a domestic violence agency. And I think, oh, cool, 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 yeah. Like a shelter, like that kind of thing. And she's like, no, 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 we um, have a program that looks at the highest, highest risk indicators for domestic violence homicide in order to prevent it. And I was like, you do what now? We have a program that predicts domestic violence homicide in order to prevent it. Now, I don't know if this sounds as stunning to you as it did to me, but I was like... 
I had covered enough sort of crime and homicides and things like that in my career to think, you can't predict a homicide that happens outside. How are you going to predict one that happens behind closed doors? And so I'm standing there. I got my little Cambodian dog who's moved back to America with me who's like, Never seen a squirrel before. That's a story I'll tell some other time. Um, and I got my little two-year-old daughter, and I got my husband, and I just say, like, take these. I'm going with her wherever she goes for the next three hours. And I do. I spend, like, the entire morning going to farmer's markets with her, going to the liquor store, going to get gas, whatever. And she begins to tell me about domestic violence. And that morning, this is... 2009, how many years ago is that now? I'm so bad at math. 14 years ago now, thank you. Um, I really count that morning as one of the most profound and humbling like, moments of my life. Because I knew instantly that if someone like me, who had all the privileges of you know, education, travel, um, you know, I'm white. I'm 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 from a, 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 a you know educated, relatively educated family. If someone like me, and I'm in the media, by the way, if someone like me could misunderstand all of this about domestic violence, then I knew there was a problem in my system, the system that I was involved in. I mean, the, the, you know, I I myself as a human was also ignorant, but there was something that the media was missing about domestic violence. So that was really my awakening. During that morning, she begins to educate me on how strangulation is a different marker of dangerousness, for example, than a kick or a slap. On how guns, no matter who the gun belongs to, could belong to the victim, could belong to the abuser, guns always make a situation more dangerous. She tells me that beatings while a victim is pregnant is another sign of dangerousness, that there's two types of abusers, right? The kind that lay off when you're pregnant and the kind that increase their, their brutality when you're pregnant. She tells me that there's a set of about 20 behaviors that could be calculated to try and predict any victim's potential risk of homicide. And these 20 behaviors are something called the danger assessment. You can look this up on your own. There's a website called dangerassessment.org. If you have a friend or a loved one or someone that you're concerned about, you can go to dangerassessment.org. And... Um, really try to quantify the level of danger. So I want to try to illustrate this with a story from my book. Some of you have read my book. Um, some of you probably haven't. So this comes from uh, the beginning of the book. And it's a story about a girl named Michelle Monson Mosier. She's 14 when she meets the man that she will someday marry. His name is Rocky. He's 24. Her mother sees her mother and father are divorced, but they're very amicably divorced and they live just like a mile away from each other in Billings, Montana. And so, and they both work full time and her mother sees a car that she doesn't recognize in front of her ex-husband's house one afternoon when she gets off work early for some reason and she thinks, ha, huh, I don't know whose car that is, but I know that my daughter's in there after school, hanging out, and so I'm going to find out. And she does, I love this, because she's, she's such a mama bear, and I would totally do this to my daughter, too. Although my daughter, by the way, who's 15, gets to say to her boyfriends, so my mom wrote this book called No Visible Bruise. <laughs> so adorable. I'm like, that's right, I did. You should be scared. Um, so Michelle's mother goes to the door, knocks on the door, no one answers, because teenagers think they're smart. Like, if we don't say anything, she won't see us. And Sally is her name. And Sally says, I know you're in there. If you don't come out, I'll call the cops. And then they're like, oh, OK. So they open the door. And Rocky says, oh, I was, I was just leaving. Uh, so nice to meet you. Yes, yes. And he, and he scurries away. And she says to her daughter, 14-year-old daughter, I don't know who that was. But he has a car, which means he's too old for you. She had no idea that he was 24. She thought he was 16 or 17. He, he looked quite young, actually. And Michelle says, yes, he says, I won't, I won't hang out with him anymore. I'm so sorry. And you know how teenagers are. They do everything we tell them to do, right? Did Michelle keep seeing him? Of course she did. 
By 15, in fact, on her 15th birthday, she finds out she's pregnant. That's when her parents discover how old he is. And by the way, that's also when his parents discover how old she is. And all four of them are in agreement that he should be charged with statutory rape. His parents, too. Right? They're going to charge him. This is a, an abomination. He's gotten a 15-year-old girl pregnant. And Michelle says to all four of them, if you do that, I will run away with him and you'll never see any of us again. And so they do what any parent would do. They say, okay, it's better to keep you close. So Michelle gives birth to a little girl named Christy. Now, Christy is born prematurely, and she's got, um, like, undeveloped lungs. She, she spends about a month in the NICU, in the, in the uh, neonatal ICU. And then they release her, and she goes with her young 15-year-old mother now, Michelle, to go live at Sally's house. And Rocky comes every day. He comes every day to see them. And Sally says, you know, I had to hand it to him. He was, he was there. He was changing diapers. He was feeding. He was doing all the things. <clears throat> At 16, Michelle is pregnant again. This time, she decides that she's going to have the kid, but they deserve to be a family, and she leaves her mother a letter and says, I've moved in with Rocky. We deserve to try to be a family. And Rocky lives in a little trailer on the outskirts of Billings. Now, Michelle... Michelle is amazing because this whole time, you know, pregnant once, then has a, a you know, premature uh, uh, newborn and then gets pregnant again, she never stops going to school. It's more than I can say for myself, actually. <laughs> Some of you that I talked to earlier today may have heard my, um, the record that I hold at my high school for having the lowest GPA of anybody who was expelled, 0.467. So it's hard to get that kind of GPA, let me just say. You've got to miss a lot of school. Um, I did make up for it, though. I do have an a, a undergraduate and graduate degree, so I just sort of skipped over those four years. But anyway, that's a topic for another day and another read. So Michelle moves into Rocky's trailer, continues going to high school, graduates high school on time at age 18 with two kids under the age of three. And her father says to her, you know what? You're living in that tiny little trailer on the outskirts of Billings. I'm building a new house. Why don't I rent you my house in town? And they're like, great. It's a cute little adorable bungalow, three bedroom. The kids each have their own bedroom. It's fantastic. Now, the thing is, Rocky had been working on a seismic crew, which took him out of town for long periods of time. And he didn't like that once Michelle was pregnant. He wanted to be around. And so he quit that job, and he never had a full-time job again. Now, people often ask me, like, oh, is unemployment, like, that's, the, people get violent when they're unemployed because they're so frustrated. No. Unemployment is not a cause of domestic violence. It is a stressor, and it's an important difference. It's an important distinction, but it is not in and of itself a cause for domestic violence. It is, however, on that list of 20 high-risk indicators, the danger assessment. So, money is really tight. Michelle's 18 years old, Rocky's 28. They're, they're living in her father's house, paying, you know, under market rent, but still. And Christy has a lot of health problems because she was born preemie. She's got really severe asthma. And so they're in and out of the hospital all the time. So they also have all this medical debt. And so Michelle one day says to Rocky, look, money is really tight. Why don't I go get a job at the Motel 6, which was walking distance to their house, and I can just like clean part-time or whatever, work the desk part-time, and it'll help bring in a little bit of money, and it's close enough that if the kids need me, I can like just walk right back. And Rocky's response to this is to freak out. He doesn't say, oh gosh, thanks for contributing. No, no, no. He says, are you accusing me of not taking care of my family? He feels emasculated. He feels like her offering to get a job is actually her accusing him of not taking care of them. And Michelle's never seen him like this before. She's like, what the, what kind of response? He goes, he gets her grandfather's 
hunting rifle. Remember I said that guns escalate the danger no matter who it belongs to? The, Michelle owned the gun legally. It was a gift from her grandfather. He gets this gun. He marches up and down the living room with the three of them, the two kids and Michelle, sitting on the couch, and he says, I will kill you if you ever accuse me of not taking care of my family again. She never accused him of not taking care of her family, but that's what he heard, right? And so she sits there kind of freaked out, and when he cal calms down, she goes into the kitchen and she calls his parents. She was really close to his parents. They come over. His dad's like, son, what are you doing? You can't do this. And Rocky's like, I know, I know. I just, you know, money's tight, and I just, I just freaked out, and it was, I shouldn't have, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done it. It won't happen again. And her parents go, his parents go, okay, all right, situation solved. But here's the thing. There is always a shadow narrative that happens behind whatever the event is that's happening in front of you with domestic violence. And the shadow narrative is this. Michelle has tried to get a job and he has shut her down. What's the message she gets? The message she gets is that he is in control. How do we know she's gotten that message? Because she doesn't actually ever work again. And as far as anybody knows, she never even offers to work again. So even though the event is over, he still has maintained control, right? So, about a year goes by, Michelle knows that she can't work, but she also knows that she's not happy with this guy. She's been with him for five years now. We don't know exactly what else happened besides that event on the couch with the Motel 6 job, but we know that he is controlling who she has over because he tells her that he doesn't want anyone over except one of her sisters because it's a bad influence on the fr on her on the kids. We also know that she used to wear lots and lots of makeup and be super into makeup and hair and now she's not. So we know that he's controlling that too. We know that from her sisters. So she goes to him and she knows, you know, you know, if you've spent years with someone, you know how to read them, you know how they're going to react to certain things. And Michelle knew that about Rocky. And so she goes to Rocky and she says, um, listen, I had an idea. Why don't I take like a couple of classes in nursing? And that way I won't have to leave so much with Christy to go to the ER. Right? So she's, she's speaking to the part of him that is insecure. She's speaking to the part of him that she knows will, will work for her, essentially. We also know that she had planned to get a nursing degree, but she never told Rocky this. We know this because she went to her dad after she was accepted to Montana State University and said, my hope is to get a nursing degree and then buy that house from you and then somehow stop living with Rocky. She's not married to Rocky, but she doesn't want to stay with him. And her dad says, well, why don't we put the house in your name now? I'll sell it to you on what's called a land contract. He sells her the house for a dollar and they drop all the paperwork. They put the house in her name. Rocky never finds out about this. The thing is, this is what leaving looks like. You'll hear stats all the time, like it takes victims seven or eight times to leave a relationship. I'm not so sure I believe that. I actually think it takes one time, years in the making, right? So Michelle is putting all these things in place. She's got a plan for a career. She's got a plan to not live with Rocky anymore so that she can take care of those kids. So she goes to school. Rocky drives her to school every day because he's a total romantic. <laughs> See, you don't even have to know me to know I'm being sarcastic. Of course he's not a romantic. He's a stalker. By the way, I tell my daughter this all the time. I say to her, you know, in the Twilight movies where Robert Pattinson's character, like the vampire guy, watches over Kristen Swartz's character while she's sleeping? First of all, he's like hundreds of years old and she's 18, right? So that in and of itself is kind of gross. But putting that aside for a second, I say to my daughter like, is that romantic? No, it's stalking, it's stalking. And she's like, okay, mom, I gotcha, I gotcha. I say the same thing about like, if a man ever comes to play music on your front lawn with an orchestra, that's not romantic, that is stalking. Okay, anyway, 
So Rocky says okay to Michelle to go to school. He drives her every day. Now when she signs up for school, she needs financial aid and the school says to her, well you gotta bring us your, your tax returns. And she says, well I don't, I don't have a job, I've never worked, I don't have any tax returns. And they're like, mm, you're 19, okay you better bring us your parents' tax returns. And she says, I, don't, I haven't lived with my parents in three years, I've got two kids, that's crazy. And they say, well you better bring us your husband's tax returns. And she says, I'm not married. And they say, hmm, well, you better get married. So Michelle does. She marries Rocky at a justice of the peace within the week. So the very thing that she's trying to do, which is leave him, she gets further embedded by a system of bureaucracy. So <clears throat> Michelle is going to school. She's got the house in her name. She has plans to to become a nurse so she can raise her kids. And she tells her sister one day, this is a couple of years in, she says, I think Rocky's having an affair. Now, her sister, who I've talked to a lot, is like, nobody thought Rocky was having an affair. Nobody. But, you know, we like to humor Michelle. Michelle was also a little bit of a hypochondriac. So, she got this in her mind and for a couple of months she was really convinced he was having an affair and so she shows up at her mother's house one day and says, I want you to take me to the doctor. I think I have an STD. And Sally's like, okay, sure, I'll take you to the doctor. Sally knows, of course, that Rocky's not having an affair. And Michelle goes and she gets checked and of course she doesn't have an STD, but the doctor, it was a minute clinic, the doctor is concerned enough with whatever he or she talked to Michelle about in that office that they gave her a prescription for antidepressants, which Michelle fills and brings home. And Rocky finds, and he throws him away and says, I'm not gonna have a crazy wife on my hands. Right, it's all about control. There's a reason my book is called No Visible Bruises. So a few months go by and Michelle shows up at her house, at her uh, mother's house again with the two kids and she says, I'm going home to confront Rocky about the affair. I'm leaving the kids here. If he comes, do not let him have the kids. Now Michelle's mother doesn't know that there is this shadow message in what Michelle is saying. But what Michelle is actually saying is these kids have been used as leverage to keep me in control. She doesn't use those words. She doesn't know to use those words, right? And Michelle's mother doesn't understand to read the situation that way. But kids are used as leverage in domestic violence again and again and again to keep a victim in control. You know, I covered the Orlando Pulse uh, trial, the nightclub, remember the nightclub shootings from f a few years ago, eight years ago maybe now or something like that? They arrested, he was killed, but they arrested his wife and held her for a year and a half without bail. She was eventually acquitted as she should have been, but she was severely, severely uh, um, uh, victimized by him. And one of the things he would do was give her $20 a week spending money and not allow her name to be on any of their bank accounts. He also didn't allow her to get a driver's license. So she was completely stuck. You don't have to be physically violent to control somebody, right? So Sally, Michelle's mother, is there with the two kids. Michelle's younger sister, Melanie, is also there. Melanie's uh, six months pregnant at the time. And about an hour goes by, and Sally sees Rocky pull up at the house, and he's just got this look on his face that she described as, like, the devil. And he marches across the lawn, and Sally goes over, and she locks her front door, and she locks her back door, and then she throws the kids on the couch and, like, throws her body across them. She said, I, it all happened, like, so quickly, I didn't know what to do. And they can hear Rocky. He breaks in the back door. He breaks the glass, unlocks the door. He leaves blood all up and down her wall. And then he comes in. Melanie, the, the pregnant sister, tries to stop him, and he throws her aside, essentially assaults her, bruising her from the shoulder to the wrist, and grabs Christy, throws her over his shoulder, and he's out the door. And Sally said, it took 20 seconds at most, and he was gone. Michelle comes to her mother's house minutes later, and for the first time ever, 
she begins to tell her mother about situations that Rocky has controlled her, not just in who she can talk to, where she can go, what she can wear, but also in beating her in front of the kids. She also says to her mother, by the way, a couple weeks ago, he went to the outskirts of Billings and he got a rattlesnake and he keeps it in a cage. And he says he's going to put it in bed with me if I do anything that pisses him off or if I disobey him. No visible bruises. So Sally convinces Michelle to call the police. This is the one and only time Michelle interacts with the police at all. She never calls them. And this is the thing about systems. Our systems have got to be in touch with each other. Because oftentimes it's only one interaction that you get. So the police come and they say, mm, well, it was his kid. What do you want us to charge him with? And Michelle and her mother are like, is that not your job? So they charge him with criminal mischief. That's it. One misdemeanor charge. The next morning, Michelle goes that Rocky has gone off to a motel for the night with Christy. Nobody knows where. The next morning, Michelle goes to the DA's office. She files an affidavit. She says, he's beaten me many times in front of the kids. There's a rattlesnake in the house and an octagon-shaped cage. Like, I just want a restraining order. The DA says, my God, this is terrible. I'm going to issue a restraining order immediately. She puts a call out to the police. Rocky pulls up in front of the house, his house, with, his, with Christy now. It's the morning. And he's immediately arrested. The police are there and they're waiting for him. He gets arrested in front of his daughter, Christy, and he gets taken to the local police station, right? And he's put in the jail there and he calls his parents immediately. Sarah and Gordon are their names. 45 minutes later, Michelle gets a phone call and it's Rocky's mother. And Rocky's mother says, oh my God, sweetheart, Rocky told us what happened. This is awful. Like he has really gone above and beyond this time. This is unacceptable. He promises he's going to get counseling. We've bailed him out. He's at his brother's house and he wants to talk to you. Now, do we have any law enforcement or lawyers here tonight? Okay, so this is, it's so awesome that usually I only talk to lawyers. Um, so this is great. So what you, what you should know is when you have a restraining order, if you have a third party contact the person who has the restraining order, that is breaking the restraining order. So Rocky doesn't break it by calling her. He has his mother do it for him, right? But Michelle doesn't know that that's breaking the restraining order. The minute she finds out that he has been bailed out, she t gets in her car, goes back to the DA's office, and recants everything. In fact, I interviewed the DA. The DA is saying, said Michelle was yelling at her saying, there is no snake. Just leave us alone. Just leave my family alone. This is a private matter. This is personal between me and my husband. She's like a totally different person. You see this again and again, victims recanting. The cops often think, oh, it's because she's crazy. It's not because she's crazy. It's because she recognizes that the system has prioritized his freedom over her safety. That's why she recants, or he. It's not because they're crazy. It's because a system has once again said, you got to marry your abuser if you want to have any hope of getting out. You, you know, your freedom is, is important, but really his freedom matters more than your life. We know this because we let him bail out for a couple hundred dollars. So, Michelle says, okay, I'll meet with him. She meets with him. He moves back in that night. Michelle lives another two months. And during the two months that she's alive, no one in her family talks to her. No one in his family talks to her. She had long been isolated from her own family by Rocky, but they were really close to his family, his parents. What do we know is happening in those two months? We know that she's negotiating for her life and the life of her kids. We know that because she doesn't reach out to anyone, because she doesn't talk to anyone. There's a domestic violence advocate that I interviewed once for my book who said, it's not the ones who show up for court to renew their restraining orders that we need to worry about. It's the ones who don't show up for court. And Michelle was one of those. So two months goes by. And Michelle's sister, brother, and mother haven't heard from her in so long, and they get worried, and they go to the house, and they find them. He's killed Michelle, 
shot her four times. He killed Christy, and then he killed Kyle, his son, and then he killed himself. So, what does this story illuminate for us? First of all, it's plot, right? Because Michelle has said, why don't I get a job? He takes it in the worst way possible, and he escalates it. And she gets it, right? And then she tries a different way. She says, ah, why don't I go to school, right? And the school says, well, we need to embed you further with him. And then she goes to her dad, and her dad says, well, let's put the house in, in, in your name. She's trying everything she can. She goes to the police, and the police do almost nothing. She goes to the DA. The DA says, mm, well, you know, my victim is recanted, so I've got nothing here. I've got too many cases. I've got to follow up on what am I supposed to do. Over and over again, she acts, and then she gets the message that her life is less important than whatever system or person is protecting Rocky. The other thing about this story is that, like all domestic violence homicide stories, there's an escalation, right? She's trying more and more and more things. And the DA, I really, you know, when I interviewed her, I really, I said to her, what would you do differently today? This is 2001 when Michelle is killed, so it's been a long time, and I probably interviewed the DA maybe around 2015, 2016, somewhere in there. And she says, oh, I wouldn't do anything different today. I mean, that to me is negligent. Luckily, she's not the DA anymore. So all of these systems that Mich Michelle tries, and I, I include here both formal systems like the police and like, um, like the judiciary, right, the DA, but I'm also including things like her family, her, she tried her mother, she tried her father. Whether that, that's a formal system or an informal system, each system gets one shot and nobody is communicating with anybody else, right? So the DA could have, for example, charged uh, Rocky with burglary, unlawful entry within the home, criminal mischief, which is the one charge he did get that was dropped, vandalism, um, kidnapping of his daughter, and for sure criminal endangerment for the snake, which is was a felony then and is still a felony. Instead, she charges him with criminal mischief and then tosses the charge when Michelle recants. So, it, wait, I've lost my place. Okay, so Michelle has dipped her toes into each one of these systems, right, and none of them is prioritizing her safety. The DA told me she knew Michelle was lying. Of course she knew Michelle was lying. Of course she knew that there was a snake. But as she said to me, the police report she has is crappy. All it charges him with is criminal mischief. Um, she never connects, the DA never connects with the medical system, who could have talked to the doctor who saw Michelle, who was concerned enough to see, to issue her uh, antidepressants. She never sends a, a police officer out for material evidence, which is essentially the snake. She doesn't interview any neighbors who could have maybe said, oh yes, we heard them fighting all the time. She doesn't interview Michelle's mother, who owns the house that now has blood on the wall. She never interviews Michelle's pregnant younger sister, who's left injured from Rocky. And she's lost her key witness, right? So she tosses the entire case as a result of that. And what is Michelle left with then? She's left with four systems that have given her the sense that she's on her own. Education, healthcare, law enforcement, and the judiciary. Today in Montana, there are two things that have changed as a result of Michelle's case. One is called the Hope Card. It's a little, it's a restraining order that is on uh, like a driver's license size laminated card and it has the picture of the abuser. These, the, there's used, it's used now in a number of states. I'm not sure if West Virginia and Maryland are two of them or not. But it's a little, it's the size of a driver's license, has the picture of the abuser, the exclusion zones, right, where are they not allowed to go to, and the dates of the restraining order, if there are dates. In states like New Jersey, a restraining order never expire. So 
there may not be dates. And victims can get as many of these cards as they want. So for example, they can pass them out at school. They can pass them out like at their kids' school. They can pass them out at work. They can pass them out to their neighbors. This very simple, low-cost thing would have saved Michelle's life. We know this because the night she was killed, there was a neighbor who saw Rocky looking in the windows of his own house. And the neighbor thought, that's so weird. He lives there. Why would he be looking in the windows? Had that neighbor had that little hope card, that restraining order, she would have known, wait a minute, he's not supposed to be there. She could have called the police. That's one change. The other change is that if you are arrested in Montana for uh, partner family violence, it's called PFMLA, I think, or something like that, you have a minimum number of hours that you have to be held before you can see a judge. And in Montana, it's something like four hours. There are other states, like New Jersey, I just spoke there last week, which is why their state laws are more fresh in my mind. In New Jersey, you're held for, I think, 48 hours. So it depends on the jurisdiction. But in Montana, you're held for a minimum of four hours. What would four hours have done for Michelle? I'll tell you what it would have done. It would have given a domestic violence advocate enough time to get to Michelle to do a danger assessment, to say, hey, here are 20 risk indicators. How many do you have? I did a posthumous danger assessment on Michelle and found she had 18 of 20. Michelle knew she was in danger. Like She knew that by the actions that she took. We knew that because she recanted. But she didn't know how to quantify the danger that she was in. She didn't know there was something called a danger assessment that could have offered her a score as to the level of danger. I mean, it's social science, so it's imperfect. But like, victims can act when they know that. The other thing that four hours would have done could have gotten the locks changed on her house because the house was in her name and not Rocky's name, something he, by the way, never found out. It would have given them enough time to pack her up and get her to shelter if that's what needed to happen. It would have given them enough time to install like a ring camera, I and mean, they didn't have ring cameras in 2001, but some sort of security camera in the house, right? All you need is a little bit of time. And the thing about, the, about all of these solutions is that these are very low cost solutions. Any jurisdiction, no matter how low the property taxes are, sorry, no, no matter how little money they have, can afford to do changes like this. These are very low cost, high impact changes. So domestic violence is one lens through which we can view the incredible set of social, social uh, issues that we face as a country. But as a lens or as a frame, it has hugely vast public consequences. It really intersects, I think, the most pressing social issues that we have. It's the leading cause of homelessness for women in this country. It's the third leading cause of homelessness overall, so it affects men too. It is present in almost every mass shooting. Either the mass shooter is also an abuser, or the mass shooter has abused, as you saw like in the Orlando Pulse shooting, abused her again and again and again. It's the leading cause of mass incarceration, actually. Um, about 80% of incarcerated men have domestic violence in their backgrounds, either as witnesses or as victims. About 95% of women incarcerated have, are victims or witnesses. It costs us over $8 billion a year in lost wages, incarceration, court fees, health care, law enforcement. One of the things that I try to encourage uh, independent businesses to do and schools like this one is to connect with their human resources department and ask, like, what are your plans? for domestic violence? Are you connected to the local advocacy group or crisis center? I had a student just a couple years ago before COVID who had a restraining order against her boyfriend. But the boyfriend was also a student at the same school. And I was like, what are the plans for that? Well, we didn't have one. I ended up driving her home every day, me. 
Like, I, what am I going to do if he shows up? Like, stop, don't. What am I going to do? I'm, I have nothing, right? We now have a plan in place, luckily, at American University. But what are the plans at your local employment center? What are the plans at your local school? Have you connected with the high school guidance counselors, right, in this town? When I talk about domestic violence, I really am talking about homelessness and gender inequality and mass shootings and mass incarceration and trafficking and sexual assault and foster kids and teen dating violence. I really am talking about all of these things. As a writer, as a journalist, the foundation of my world is very simple. We have one question that we have a responsibility to ask as journalists and writers, and that is, what are the systems, who's benefiting, and who's losing from those systems? We need to recognize what people like Michelle may not know they know, right? We need to know what victims can't say. We need to know the context that they may not understand that they're living in. I think it's really up to us. I'm gonna leave you with my favorite Gandhi quote. He said, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. Thank you. I think we can, um, we have time for some questions. And I think there's microphones somewhere out here. Oh my God, there are people out there. Now I can see. I would, be, I would be so terrible if I was Taylor Swift, like having those blinding lights all the time. <sighs> Poor girl. Yeah, down here in front. I'll repeat the question. How long in total did it take for me to write the book and publish it? That's a really good question. Longer than it should have is the simple answer. Um, it took me about eight years to write it. Um, from the time of publishing, like when you turn it in till the time of publishing, it's about a year. Um, but part of, part of why it took so long is that I knew so little. And I really spent the first year and a half to two years reading everything that, that Suzanne DeBuse told me to read, interviewing people on background, just learning everything I didn't know. And then the second problem was once I realized I had um, the makings of a book, I couldn't figure out how to structure it in a way that was interesting. <laughs> like I was like, well, we have 400 years of not caring about domestic violence victims in this country, so how do I write a book that people will read that doesn't actually like talk about domestic violence in the title. Like I, the, the subtitle is what we don't know about domestic violence can kill us. I fought and fought and fought to have the word domestic taken out of the subtitle because I thought nobody will want to read it if it's about domestic violence. Obviously, I lost that fight because my publisher said, but if anybody searches in Google, this book won't come up. And I thought, well, that is a conundrum. So I lost that fight, but I really was like thinking initially like, oh, I'll write a chapter on the police, and then I'll write a chapter on advocates, and then I'll write a chapter from a victim's point of view, and then I'll write a chapter from an abuser's point of view. And that was like, that's like the most boring way to possibly tell a story. Um, and so it took me years of trying to figure out how I would structure it so that you felt like from every sentence to the next, you couldn't put it down. Like that's what I, I really was like, you know, if this was a thriller, <laughs> what's gonna keep you reading from any given sentence to the, to the next or the next chapter, right? So I wanted to like, accidentally get people into the book like, oh, I've just now, do, how do I know so much about domestic violence from this incredibly written book? So it took me a long, long time. Uh, yeah, in the back. Uh, how often do you think grooming takes a part in uh, domestic violence? How often do I think grooming takes part in domestic violence? Um, it's, that's a really interesting question. I think the, I think the word grooming suggests um, uh, foresight. And I don't know that abusers have that much foresight. I think they're much better at looking at 
what they might potentially lose rather than I have a long-term goal, right? I think they are very much sort of moment by moment, event by event, trying to rest control back. Um, but I will say that I'm reading a book right now. <laughs> I'm re do, you, have you guys, do you guys know Masha Gessen, the writer? Masha Gessen, National Book Award winner, writes for The New Yorker, Russian, Jewish, okay, whatever. Anyway, so Masha Gessen's like my smartest friend. And um, she has me reading a book right now on uh, the authoritarian um, philosophy of uh, the Mao Zedong government in 1950s China as it was used to coerce political prisoners. Because what she said to me is, it's exactly like domestic violence. It's the same kind of coercion and authoritarianism. It's just whether it's state-sponsored or coming from one person inside the home. So I think <laughs> and I have to say, like, I'm reading the book and I'm like, oh, I kind of understand it, but also kind of don't because Masha's so freaking smart. Um, but it is, there is this really, like, corollary to the control that an abuser uses in ho her or his own home. And it does mimic uh, a state like Russia or a state like North Korea or, uh, you know, any number of, of other places in, in the world. I mean, they're the same philosophical tactics apply. That was a much bigger question than what you asked, but I'm excited about that, this book. Yes? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Did you guys hear that question? Gosh, how am I going to sum up that question? So, um, <laughs> so he, he, he asked me about the former president. It's unclear to me which former president. <laughs> um, uh, who essentially gaslights women and now we have this whole sort of like, you know, fringe element that has become mainstream that, of course, not only doesn't care about women, but is actively trying to take away our power, is actively trying to shut us down. I mean, I think, um, I mean, I have a daughter too, and I, I'll tell you, uh, the New Yorker, the, the, there's a... Um, Story in No Visible Bruises, that was my first story that I ever published for The New Yorker, and it was back in like 2013 or something. And they turned it down initially. They were like, you know, this is, oh, it was, I can tell, it's a, it was about the high-risk team movement and the danger assessment. Like, we have this way of predicting homicide before it happens. And the editor was like, you know, this is, this is a really great idea, but I just, you know, I don't think it's going to work for us, um, but, you know, pitch us again. And I was like... You know, as a writer and a journalist, especially freelance, like you take a lot of rejection. I mean, it's like it's like trying to be an actor. Like you just have to deal with you know the fact that you're going to get 20 rejections for every acceptance. But this rejection felt personal to me because it felt like a reflection of like the world that my daughter was going to be growing up into, and the stakes of it felt so high. And so I wrote back to her. It was a, a, a woman, the, this particular editor, and I said, you know, I understand why you're rejecting this story, 
But the fact is, if women were killing men in the same numbers that men are killing women, this would be the front page of every newspaper in this country. But it is so normalized. I mean, think about every crime show, this whole like, true crime podcast movement, which I love, but 98% of the victims are women. Like, it is just over and over and over again. And she actually, to her credit, said, you know, you're, you're right. Actually, I am going to turn around and assign this story to you. Um, I say that because that's what we're up against. Even those of us who, like, know, we have to get, we have to get over our own, our own cultural acclimation to some extent. And, you know, I thought, when I, I, I lived in Cambodia during Bush 1 and into Obama. Any Chicago people out here, by the way? No? Okay. I, was, I, I mean, from, being from Chicago, I was like watching in Phnom Penh as he was winning, and I was like, whoa! Um, but I remember li being overseas and people having to, exp like, asking me, how could, how, could, how could George Bush have gotten elected? And I, I remember thinking, like, I don't know, your guess is as good as mine. He seems dumb as a stump. Like, I don't know. And now he looks downright savvy. And, you know, I, I, um, I mean, I come from a family on my father's side that is very right wing. They loved Trump. My father, well, my father died at the start of COVID, and I just found all this stuff under his bed. I found the MAGA hat. I found a gun. I didn't grow up, like, with people who, we don't know what to do with a gun. Like, we're like, Whoa, you know. I was like, what is he thinking? I mean, I had a, th my three-year-old nephew lived in the house with him. I mean, it was insane. Um, you know, he, he had a certificate of um, his graduation into the Morris Sorello Army. Do you guys know Morris Sorello, famous evangelical? I don't know how much my dad paid for that, but he certainly paid for it. I don't know what the answer is writ large, but I do know that we can't, if we, can't, if we think about systems like law enforcement as a system, of course, that's impossible to change. But those of us who are in this room, we are all part of both formal and informal systems. We are part of family systems. We are part of friend systems. Maybe we have a walking group in the morning. Maybe we have a, a, a martini group at night. I'm going to start that one, actually. Maybe we have, um, you know, maybe we're at the dog park with, with, with our little puppies or whatever. I'm, now I'm, you know, projecting, obviously. But... Um, those are all of our informal systems. Our for, more formal systems are we have we work at a, a, at you know companies that have employment agencies. We are members of of this school. All of those systems need this awareness. All of those systems need to need to know what resources is, exist, not just for victims but for abusers. Are there, is there abuser intervention? Is there restorative justice on this campus, right? What do, what do victims do, not only to heal, but how can we bring abusers back into the fold? Because we can't just kick everybody out, right? We can't live in a totally fractured society. So I don't know what we can do writ large, but I know what we can do in our small little neighborhoods. So that's where my hope lies, I think. Yes. How big of a part does location play in it? What do you mean? Like, well, there's no, I mean, statistically, they're just as likely in a rural population as they are in urban populations. I think the difference is that how you treat that each situation changes. So, for example, if you're in a rural area, it may take police longer to get to somewhere, right? So that's that's an issue for that local jurisdiction. If you're in uh, a city, you're gonna have much higher volumes. I was in Brooklyn, uh, I forget which, pre the uh, seven, eight maybe or something. I don't know, I confuse it with Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which is not a real precinct. Um, <laughs> but they get something like 10,000 calls a month Right, so in terms of of just sheer scale, how do you how do you ramp up a program like the high risk program that looks at these twenty risk indicators when you're getting ten thousand calls a month? And those are those are big questions that jurisdictions have to ask. But there are there there are programs in the works, like Cleveland, Ohio, which is in my book, was a test um, was a test city. There, I guess they have five different 
parts of Cleveland, and they were testing this high-risk team movement in one of them when I was writing the book. Um, and since then, it's become so successful that it's now being used across all five. But you know, I think that this man's question is right. Like we've got cultural change we have to make. You know, the, the people ask me all the time if abuser intervention uh, courses work, and my my answer is always like yes and no. Like, does alcohol do, do, do addiction services work? Like, yes, they do, but they only work for someone who really wants to change. Like the desire for change has to come from the inside out. And so what I have found works is when an abuser says, you know what, it's to my benefit to live a life in which my children and my spouse are not scared of me. And that's, I think, that's when you can get to find change. That's kind of gone beyond your question. But um, over here. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> why am I a writer and why did I write this book, more or less? How did I, um, so my, um, my grandfather was a writer, actually. His name was Dr. Charles Lee. He was also on the radio, which is why I say his name so weirdly. But he was a poet and a journalist. He was a journalist during World War II. Um, and his last name was Levy, and he changed it to Lee so that he could write about what was happening to the Jews, um, which is kind of amazing. And so I have always, I talked earlier in a class about how much poetry plays uh, a part in my, in my reading life and my professional life, and I think that really comes directly from him. So he was a writer, and he used to send me like big boxes of books at Christmas every year, and they were books like, really thick books like the Oxford Illustrated History of the English Language. I was like six, you know? And I was like, oh God, my grandpa thinks I'm so smart. I didn't know that he was just like offloading the free textbooks he got every year. Um, but he was the one who always encouraged me to keep a journal. His twin brother, my great uncle, created the Adams Family. You know, da -da -da -da. that guy, yeah. Um, he created it with Charles Adams. His name was David Levy. And so, and he also wrote really bad science fiction novels. So um, writing was like just a kind of a, a place that I could explain the world to myself. Um, but all four of my books have been very different. Two are literary journalism. One is a memoir. One is a novel. I don't know, I'll maybe write poetry one day, or I just, I love writing in all of its forms. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that uh, at one point you were pretty ignorant to like domestic violence and like what it was. Uh, what was like your wake up call? What was my wake up call to domestic violence? It was that moment on the driveway of my friend where I learned that I was so completely ignorant. It really was that, like, how could I have spent all this time, interviewed all these people all over the world, and not known that this kind of violence is like the origin story? There's real, I mean, I think anybody who's like maybe over 40, that's a random, totally random age, but like, I feel like we get more humble about what we don't know the older we get. And that experience in particular, I was like, wow, what else don't I know? <laughs> and I really, you know, this is why I'm reading a book on 1950s authoritarian China. Like, I don't know anything about it. Um, so I think it was, it was that aha moment for me. And now I'm, I just have those all the time because I'm constantly reading. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, um, with the danger assessment, dangerassessment.org, how much does alcohol play into any that, like that kind of thing? Like a gun increases the danger, and um, 
so alcoholism or addiction, it, uh, that's one of the 20 high risk indicators, but just like unemployment, it's a stressor, not, not a cause. So it's not, for example, there are three, the top three um, dangers on the danger assessment and they're weighted. So the top three are sort of the big important ones are, um, and I may see if you guys can Google it because you all have phones here because I may get this slightly wrong, but one is prior incidents of domestic violence, two is um, strangulation or choking, and three is access to a weapon. I think those are the top three. So alcoholism is, is a stressor or, or any kind of addiction. Unemployment is a stressor, um, but they're not they're not causes, but you will see it on TV. I mean, yeah, you see lots of stuff on TV. As I always tell my daughter, like, sweetie, if you don't read, you'll never understand the forces that control your life. And she's like, that does not convince me to love reading. So what are you gonna do? Yes, sir. Is the victim's age a factor? That's a good question. It's, um, so, what, you've, what I found, and I didn't do this on purpose, but in the book, all the women who ended up being killed in my book met the person who would eventually kill them when they were 14 or 15 years old. This is why the fact that sex education isn't taught in 18 of our 50 states scares the hell out of me, right? Because that's, that's exactly the age at, at, at which they have to they have to be taught what consent is. I mean, we now have students, I have students as a professor uh, who are coming from states where they've never been introduced to the concept of consent. Um, so the girls, the young women who ended up killed tended to, to sort of fall into patterns very early. Um, there are, I mean, there is this kind of accumulated wisdom of like you eventually age out of crime. Um, people, criminologists who study crime could talk about this, like you, you eventually age out of crime. But I was, you know, I'm doing, for my next book, I'm doing all this prison research right now. So I've spent a ton of time in California in the two women's prisons there. And, you know, I met a woman in July who was in her 70s who had been married for many, many years, decades, and her husband got dementia and then Alzheimer's and got really violent. And she eventually killed him. And she was sentenced to three years. I mean, she, you know, three years isn't very long, but when you're 81, as she was, that's a very, very long time. So, but those are, those are, those, that's not typical. That's an atypical situation. Uh, yeah, right here in the white. Say that again. What book has the most value to me from my book? Which quote? Which quote? Oh, God. <laughs> I don't know. Because sometimes people will be like, oh, you wrote, uh, and I'm like, I did? That's such a good sentence. I don't remember writing that. Um, I don't know. I don't think I can answer that. I said something earlier, didn't I? Some advocate told me, like, it's the women who don't show up for court that we should be worried. Like, that's a good one. But I didn't say that. I'm just quoting her. I don't know. I need about a week to think about that one and get back to you. Uh, yeah. By the way, I have no idea how much time is passing. This is like Vegas in here with no clocks. So just somebody signal me if I am talking too much. Yeah. Um, personally, going off of that really quickly, I don't know if you Or why is he violent in the first place? Yeah. Uh, my actual question, uh, what drew you to the specific cases during your research that you chose to find to write about? Oh, what well, drew me to my cases that I chose to write about? That's, that's not as deep of an answer as you would wish. It was really who was accessible to me and who would talk to me. Um, but also, like in the case of Michelle and Rocky, her case, her um, murder changed everything in Montana. Um, so it seemed really important. And then also Rocky's family was willing to talk to me. You often don't have the other side, right, that is willing to talk to you. And I felt like that was an important, um, an important voice. But there really, it really was sort of like what's accessible to me and who's accessible to me. Yeah.
Oh, that's a good one. A piece of writing advice that I think everyone should know. Um, I mean, one is that you'll never be a writer if you're not a reader, right? It's not just that you won't understand the forces that control your world. It's that you won't be reading like a writer. Um, so I think I think you have to read. Uh, and I I count like audiobooks as reading. I mean, I'm re I'm listening to an audiobook as I'm driving home tonight. I'm listening to The Covenant of Water. If anyone's ever read that. Um, but I also uh, let's see writing advice. I mean, I just um, I think that you have to allow yourself moments of quiet. I think that's the biggest thing. I had my students a couple of weeks ago. I gave them an assignment where they were to sit in one spot for an hour without their phone. That was hard enough, right? Like the whole hour without their phone. And then I wanted them to write what they heard. And what ended up happening was exactly what I hoped would happen, which is there's the surface level of what you hear, right? Like if we all got very quiet in here today, what would we hear? We'd probably hear like an air conditioner unit. And we'd hear like some paper ruffling. Maybe we'd hear a click of a phone. But inevitably, the longer you sit somewhere, the more the sound has depth. And the more, the more sounds you hear, and birds suddenly start to sound different, and you get all this, this like depth, and I think you can do that with any, you can do that visually, you can do that with audio, you can do that with you know, listening to people's dialogue. So I think, I think learning to be still is a big one. Am I, am I out of time? I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> A corrections officers like in prison? No, but they are usually included in the police statistics. So the police stats are that it's about 40% higher, abuse is about 40% higher among the population of, you know, police officers and they usually include corrections officers in that. Uh, yeah, way back there. Oh, I love these small questions. The most important observation I've made across all domestic violence. I mean, um, I would. Say, I don't. Mm, I don't know if I can narrow it down to one thing, but I would say that shame plays an enormous part for both victims and abusers. Victims are ashamed that they are in a situation where they are being abused, and every single victim is has said to me, and I mean every single one has said. I'm not your typical victim, right? So we all have an idea of what that victim is, and it's never us. Um, but for abusers, same thing. They're ashamed um, that they don't have any other access other than violence. They're ashamed of, you know, being caught. They're ashamed that they're, and they have all said to me, almost all of them have said, I'm not your typical abuser, right? So I think one of the things we have to do is, try to extract the shame and give people space to talk about it, whether they're victims or abusers, right? Um, oh, I think, I think that's done. My phone is just going and going. The clock is just going and going. Um, I think that's good. I, I'm, I may be here to sign books. Oh, what? Last question. Okay, last question. Sorry. When a victim's psychological is different than what they're saying, you mean when they're... Like when you know they're a victim but they're not coming forward? Exactly. Yeah, okay. So first of all, that is super common, just super common. And I think the one thing we have to do is give them space um, to be the ones to come forward. We cannot force that out of them. All we can do is try to be non-judgmental and say, I'm here for you, I'm here for you, I'm here for you, again and again and again. And it may take a very, very long time. It's a frustrating response, but that, that's the truth. You know, Michelle's uh, mother-in-law knew that she was the victim of domestic violence, Rocky's mother. And she used to leave brochures and pamphlets out on the table about the local shelter for Michelle. And Michelle would just not, 
She just was not talking about it. The only, the one and only time she spoke about it was the night that she went over to her mother's house, you know, when the Christie had been taken and her mother called the police. And that was the moment that those systems should have gotten together and intervened and they failed her. So, um, you know, you, you cannot force someone. You just have to be open and let them come to you. Okay, thank you all very much, I appreciate it. <laughs>